Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to e-commerce conversations, a podcast by practical e-commerce. What is going on? internet eric vandals back again with another e-commerce conversations i hope all is going well on the other side of the internet on the other side of uh the table from me tim how you doing sir doing well <laughs> it's great being here we haven't seen each other in uh, years it's been it's been a long time we met she's i guess the dynamite circle 2015 in person in 2015 in barcelona yeah long time ago yeah seven years ago i guess yeah huh? For those who don't know, the Dynamite Circle is kind of like a location-independent entrepreneur community. Yeah. Is the way I would describe it. Ian Schoen, is that how you mm -hmm. pronounce his yeah. last name? And he's got a podcast called Tropical MBA as well that y'all should listen to if, if y'all want to go that route. Yeah. Do they still do that? Yeah, they still do the uh, TMBA podcast. Yeah. yeah it, cranking it out every week. Tim and I worked together a number of years ago, and he was my business coach at the time. And it's crazy to think about that, you know, seven years ago, where we were then and where we are now. And, you know, like Beard Brand being my first real business and just like the fires, the constant fires right. that we were going through in those early years and, and just being able to, to get perspective. Why don't you give our listeners like a real quick rundown of kind of what you do and who you are and where you've been? Wow. That's, that's a big topic. Yeah, it's a big question. As, as old as I am, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> So uh, I do business coaching for entrepreneurs. I've been doing it now um, involuntarily, I think, for about 15 years where I tried to retire from work and my clients wouldn't let me. And they wanted me to continue doing marketing and operations work inside their companies. And I didn't want to do it. So I said, I'll teach you how to do it. I'll teach you what I know. And that form of consulting eventually morphed into what my clients started calling coaching, even though I had no idea what one of those were. And I've been doing that now where we go into a company and really see where they're at and get them over those mental blocks that they institute into their own mind. They see all these problems and they don't know how to solve them, even though they do. Right? Like they know the mechanics of solving them, but they emotionally can't solve them. And so that's what I help my clients do is figure out how to get past that and how to get their team to get past their team's blocks. And it just amplifies everything that they're already doing. Yeah. I think about like my transition from like, um, you know, a person with the co-founder, just a small team and doing everything to hiring people to help and kind of like that transition from like doing things to having other people do things and kind of like as a leader within a company, you kind of go from, you know, the quote unquote consultant to a coach. How was, was that transition for you? I would imagine it would be hard to like take off your cleats and then, you know, put on your coaching hat. Yeah. It was really difficult because I was so used to just solving a problem. You brought me a problem. Your company said, I need this fixed and I fixed it. And then I walked away. And coaching really required me to understand the psychology of the people involved more so than actually understanding the problem. Because the problem, it's just mechanics. In numbers, we just figure out what are the pieces that need to be put together and run them. But then no one was running them. Why? And answering that question, why, became my driving force. Yeah. What do you see with a lot of your clients? Is there kind of any kind of commonalities between things that are holding them back or is every individual got different baggage? Uh, most entrepreneurs are very similar to each other. One is that they, I call them both the firefighter and the arsonist. So if things are going well in their business, an entrepreneur will set fires in it so they can put them out. 
And if things are going terribly, they're happier because they're so busy putting out fires, even though they'll tell you that they're not happy and mm. they want it to run smoothly. And I think that's the biggest thing that I see that's really common with uh, entrepreneurs who are like usually solo founders. Like they, they really want to just get in and muck it up, right? They just like getting into the thick of things. As a company grows, you don't need that skill anymore. It's great at the beginning where you're inventing, you're taking something that was an idea and turning it into a reality, like manifesting an idea into reality. It requires that burning energy. But then after a few years, that burning energy just burns the whole thing to the ground. And learning how to uh, let go of that is the one common thing I see. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> like, I feel like you're describing me to, a, not to a T, but I can really resonate with that. Uncom it, it really, as an entrepreneur, I feel very uncomfortable if there's not a lot going on. Yeah. It's like a weird, it's it just like weird. It's like something, if things aren't going on, then something's broken is almost right. what it feels yep. like. So you know, what are the steps that entrepreneurs need to take to make that transition from arsonist to firefighter? Or I guess they're not a firefighter. They're just like a, right, a spectator, there's no fire, right? right? There, there's no fire. Like learning actually to let other people in the company uh, battle their own fires. Because fires are always going to exist in a company. Uh, just as long as you're growing, there's going to be fires. And even if you're not growing, you know, there's going to be fires as you are dying. And letting your people handle those fires themselves, learning that skill is incredibly important. But then you've got to, it's like breaking a habit. Like you don't just give up a bad habit. You really need to replace it with a different habit mm -hmm. or it won't stick. And so entrepreneurs have this habit of getting involved and starting a problem so they can fix it. Or if they see somebody having a problem, they come in to be Superman to fix it. Giving them some creative outlet inside the company is usually the easiest thing that, to solve that problem. It's like, because your original creative outlet was the business. I'm creating it. Now we need to figure out how to create something new that doesn't mess with the thing that you just created, right? So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs spend more time on product development or they move to marketing or something like that, that they have some creative outlet and then they let other people run the machine because if they touch the machine, they're going to go mess it up. Yeah. And, and I, that's, that's usually where I start is finding the people who need to make the shift over to some other creative outlet is finding what is it that they truly desire to create and what kind of creation do they like and finding a role for that. And it's usually a part-time role because I still have to teach them how to do the boring stuff of like knowing your numbers, uh, managing lots of people, things like that. A lot of entrepreneurs don't like that part. <laughs> yeah. No. Right. So, I, I it. yeah. Yeah. So a lot really hate that. And they're too small to hire a professional CEO. Yeah. Like the clients I work with who are usually under 5 million and they aren't big enough to hire a professional CEO yet. So they really have to acquire those skills. But if I don't give them some creative outlet, they won't learn the boring stuff. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can relate to that. There's this right here is a, a jar that I'm pointing to. It's like sovereignty bomb divine, which was like a, a side project for me when I was feeling bored in the business, knowing that if I came out with some, weird product for beard brand or got the, the team roped into something that to, to satiate my boredom, that it would be a distraction. And we just, uh, I don't know, we put like 500 bucks into this or something like that. <laughs> and then I got bored with it, of course, like, right. like everything else. And, and now it's just kind of going to gradually decline to its own death or it, it's already died, I guess I should say. And, yeah. you know, I, I feel like that $500 investment and a little bit of focus when things were boring probably help the company just, you know, not start new fires. Right, know, really. right. Because otherwise you would have gone to your team 
and try to get them to do something new. It's like, oh, let's, I got this great idea. I had a brilliant idea last night. Let's do this. And they're like, I got all these other responsibilities. How am I going to do what I need to do and do the boss's new idea? Like, how do I do that? And then they just drop all the old stuff that keeps the company running to work on the boss's new idea. How do you, I mean, because eventually the company does need new ideas. It mm-hmm. does need growth and needs to take new risk. Like, how do you find that balance for when those ideas are coming in and like when it should be diverted? Okay, that's a great question because I think every company, even young ones, should have a research and development. Like, actually spending time on R&D that they have... Uh, no matter what their business type is, they need to have somebody who's looking to the future that is not mucking up what the present is doing. And when you're really small, well, that's somebody who has to be able to compartmentalize. And that's where I usually talk to the entrepreneur and get them to do some kind of creative outlet that is thinking about the future where we can get stuff on the drawing board and start mapping out a plan that can get implemented as a company has the resources to fund it. And that way they can continue to create while uh, the company continues to run. And a lot of companies that I've worked with that start struggling at around uh, anywhere from like one to three million, usually around three, is that they did not invest in R&D because they were so busy just making the company. And now the market's changed three years later and they're still doing what they invented in their company three years before, uh, uh, $3 million before. And now everybody, they've got a ton of competition. They don't have any fresh things. And then they start to panic. Yeah. And that's why if you start developing a habit of R&D, it doesn't have to be expensive, $500, right? It doesn't have to be expensive, but you can start testing ideas on a drawing board that it's kind of like uh, paper trading. If you're learning how to invest, like do it on paper first right. before you actually commit the resources. One of the challenges that I've had now we've been in business for, for 10 years is the concern of, you know, building out your in e-commerce, like your product line mm-hmm. to the point where like, do these products work together? You know, like, you know, beard brand, like if we came out with the skincare line or a shaving line or something like that, you know, is that going to be too confusing, too broad for our customers or, you know, like how do you stay focused where you can really convey what you're about in the best possible way? And again, like kind of find that balance between focus and continued growth. Well, in product development, eventually you have to expand the product line. You, you just have to or you're, you're never going to grow enough unless your goal is to stay niche, right? Yeah. If your goal is like, we're going to stay this so f- hyper-focused, this is what we're about. Then you have to be willing to let that business go ultimately when the market changes yeah. because you're too focused on, on market conditions today. And eventually you have to, if you want to grow and you want to still exist, just exist, you need to expand your product line. And then every so often you're going to make a new Coke. Yeah. Right. You're you're going to create something. You're going to put a ton of money into it, a ton of uh, resources, and it's going to flop. I'm shrugging here. Well, well, I mean, like like, there's, there's no, there's no way around that. Yeah. If you don't push hard into a new product line, if you don't expand it just to find out, does the market want this or not? Yeah. Right. You know, granted, we can look back at new Coke in 2020 hindsight, like, oh, I guess we could have asked our people if they, uh, our customers. Well, I think they, they did like plenty of market research and everybody liked the, the taste, new, the taste, right? They didn't like the name, right? Right. Cause they killed the original Coke Yeah. and people liked the original Coke. What they should have done was added new Coke, yeah. right? Just put the two on the shelves side by side and let the market buy. But instead they chose for the market. Yeah. And the market said, no, we don't want that. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's it's always kind of interesting, like the decisions that you make that in the moment, they seem like the right decision, you know, right. like 
from my perspective as an entrepreneur, I'd be like, well, you know, having multiple SKUs and the complexities that come with multiple SKUs and limited shelf space in, in right. the time, like they may have not been able to have the shelf space. So they had to pick like one or the other and feeling like this new product was a better product and they improved it. I can understand, you know, like those decisions behind right. it. Right. I think it's, it's just uh, a lot of uncertainty. One thing that I wanted to also like challenge is listeners who are battling between, you know, like, should I invest in new products is not to forget that there's new markets as well for mm -hmm. your existing products. So if you're having challenges operationally, like developing new products, you know, could you sell into to Europe or Asia or developing countries, or could you sell into a new channel like Amazon or build out your own website or get into retail? Like these are all endeavors that take a lot of resources to grow right. that are indeed things but eventually yes like you're mm -hmm. going to have to also develop that r&d to kind of expand i think yeah uh, everybody's got to do it and i think if you develop the habit early then you don't get into a panic situation later yeah you know what does a, a coaching relationship look like is this uh you know we're texting every single day or like how do you hold your clients accountable to the things they say they're going to do uh, in the early days, I would do like weekly coaching where we'd get on a call once a week and it works great, I guess, in the early part of the relationship. But then I found that there's so many things that an entrepreneur has to handle and the projects are big and they don't need a weekly call. It's like, I just need to go get stuff done for a week, two weeks, a month, but then I need some guidance again. And so I switched from weekly because I looked around at the time because I didn't know what a coach was. Mm -hmm. And I saw that people did these weekly calls with clients. So I did too and found that entrepreneurs don't actually need that. They need somebody when they need somebody. So I do like twice a month typically for a client for like maybe six months now. And then we look at expanding it to once a month, um, once every six weeks, whenever is necessary for them. And then email anytime. So like recently a client, uh, she really needed some input because she was pitching a big account and she sent me this email with this big problem and like, let's get on a call. Yeah. Right. Cause I could write you this book on how to solve this, or I could just kind of help you work through it. And so we got on a call and we did some role playing on how to handle the situation. Uh, the other thing I talked about, or you talked about earlier was rolling out how to help entrepreneurs manage. Is there a particular like management framework like EOS that you lean into, or is it kind of dependent on the, the client and what they're trying it's, to do? It's the client uh, personality types. We won't discuss the work we did together in any depth, but like your style of management really didn't fit with your stated goals at the time. Like you wanted these certain things, but your management style didn't match up. And, and we talked about that in coaching. So if like finding your style, like, oh, I, I can't just tell you the same things that I told these other people because those people had a different view of their relationship to their business. And, and so you have to find uh, each individual's leadership traits like some, some of it's like innate, like they've got just a way they approach things and then skills that they need to learn or skills that they already have. And pushing people into a specific framework might be good on the macro, like, oh, you should learn this, you should learn that. But the day to day, it really comes down to personality type and giving them the usually just the permission to be themselves yeah. instead of trying to follow some management book. Yeah. Are there particular books that you would, I mean, I know you said rather than just following some kind of management book, but are there particular frameworks or books that are more conducive to a certain type of personalities? Like for anyone who's listening, who, you know, like if you could describe like a personality and what kind of style works best for them. Oh gosh, I'm kind of an academic. So, uh, so I would say read anything, Peter Drucker. Okay. Right. Just read any of that. And then Dr. Well, Peter Drucker did like, he did like Toyota and he was, right? he's essentially the uh, like, godfather of modern management. Yeah. 
So, uh, so he wrote basically everything that a lot of us still do today. Even most people don't learn what he wrote through his books. They learn it because it became DNA in companies. And I, I think learning it from the source as best you can is a lot better than learning it by someone else's bad habits inside of a corporation that you got a job at. Uh, so I would say doing that. But then for entrepreneurs, I would say Dr. Ichak Adizas. He's got some really good books on leadership because. Okay. Well, first, okay. Drucker, give me like the 15 second pitch of like what he did innovative uh, with management. Okay. So his biggest uh, contribution to management was he understood that we were leaving the world of widgets and working in knowledge. And I think he's the person who coined knowledge worker. And he's like, we have all these people in these large corporations and they don't touch widgets. They're not on a factory floor. They're not involved in any of that. How do we determine productivity among people whose production is knowledge? Like, how do we do that? And that, that's what he put his career into, was how do we figure out uh, how to treat all these people who are sitting at desks and not at machines? And, fig- uh, and that, was, I, that was, I think, so revolutionary that even today, most people still don't understand it because people are still trying to measure their knowledge workers on, you know, button seat time. Yeah. Like they haven't figured out a good way of determining. If yeah, it's like a salesperson, like the number of calls you make is easy, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, and, and how many closes, like yeah. you made this many calls and you close this many, but somebody who's sitting down and writing code, like how are they productive? Yeah. How do you measure it? Cause one person can sit down and write code and it becomes a billion dollar business. And another person who writes code and it doesn't even function. Right. right? So like, and that's on the extremes. And then there's all this gray space in the middle. Like, how, how do we measure it? So how does he suggest that you measure it? You don't uh, measure it in the old school ways. You don't measure it through time. You don't measure it through output. You measure it through results. And that's really murky, yeah. measuring results, because you can't guarantee their outcome. Right. And there might be multiple people associated right. with a project. Right. And-, and so there's a lot more hands-on. So, and if you look at management from the 1950s through the 1980s, this middle management crowd just kept blossoming. It just kept getting bigger and bigger because they were trying to figure out how to deal with what are people doing. And it, and it requires a lot of hands-on work. So I, with entrepreneurs, I have them coach their own people sit down 10 minutes a week for a while. And then, you know, every so often, like once a month, sit down with every one of your people and see where they're at and discuss how they're actually producing their work and how to make it better. Because that's ultimately all we're really able to control is the system, not the outcome. So if if we want better outcomes, we just create better systems. Mm -hmm. So we spend more time on the system and the psychology and less time on measuring the actual output. Yeah. So uh, utilizing an entrepreneur's ability to solve problems by focusing on uh, their team members' problems and asking good questions on how those team members might be able to right, right. solve. Because the one thing I've kind of realized over time is not every employee is good at identifying problems or solving those problems, but they're really good at kind of the things they do let's say a a copywriter or whatever, you put them in front of a desk to write something, they could write something brilliant, but they may not know what to write about. And like helping them figure out those processes to find the topics are great ways. The other person you talked about, how do you spell that? Like, because there's no like, or or how do you even like kind of Google it? I I believe it's uh, I, uh, Ichak Adizas. Uh, So Dr. Adizas, I think it's I-C-H, K or C-K. And uh, Adizas is A D I. So Echak is his first his name. first name. Okay. And Adizas uh, A D I Z E S. Okay. Uh, so it's easier just do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like just do Adizas. Google will figure it yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. In in Amazon, and you can grab his books. And I think those are really good for entrepreneurial leadership. His contribution was that uh, he looked around at all the management books, 
and they all contradicted each other. And it's one of the things that attracted me to it because I was helping all these entrepreneurs and they all had different personality types and everything I read told me to tell them to behave a particular way, but that wasn't effective. It wasn't useful. Yeah. And so his research and his writings were all around finding the right trait in a leader and amplifying that and then getting other people who were stronger at these other characteristics that are necessary for leadership and putting them in a leadership position. So it's a, a more of a, a guide at the top and then all the strengths around that guide. Uh, so the CEO is more about pointing which direction we're going to go and less about needing all the skills, yeah. right? Because like you read all the books about management and leadership and that person's godlike, like to be able to do any of those things, right. it's like you would have godlike powers and no one, no one is like that. Yeah. Except for like Bezos and... You know, the, the, the people are billionaires who have some kind of... Except if you actually look at them, they're surrounded by brilliant, skilled people. Yeah. And that's where the best entrepreneurs succeed is that they're better at getting the right people around them pointed in the right direction versus being godlike. How do you attract really skilled people and, and help them want to work for your project? have a bigger vision for the future than they have for themselves. Why does that attract those kind of people? And, and why are those people not off doing their own kind of thing? Like they just can't see the vision or? Uh, they might not have a big enough vision for themselves and they don't want to do all the crap that comes with being an entrepreneur. Like literally, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. But they're doing like crap that's far harder than the crap that a visionary is doing. Like a visionary is just like, like Elon, I just want to be on Mars. Right. Y'all do all this. Like to me, all this stuff to get on Mars seems like really hard other yeah. than saying we're going to Mars. Right. But that strangely is the hardest part. Yeah. The act of creation is far harder than anything else. Why is Elon surrounded by all these brilliant people other than the fact that he can pay them? It's because they all want to work on really hard problems that the only way you can do that is someone else being willing to herd all the cats. Yeah. Getting everybody pointed in the right direction is the most valuable skill in business. If you can do that and you have a big vision on the other side of that direction, then you're going to attract people who want to do that thing. Yeah. Right? So like for our Listeners who have maybe a quote unquote ordinary product or they're, they're an Amazon seller with a widget on Amazon, they don't feel like it's a very big project. How do you help them level that vision up to be able to, to level the business up? Sometimes you don't. Yeah. Because like I said, the trick is having a bigger vision of the future than the people who you're surrounded by. And the best people that you want working for you have big visions. Like they have big goals for themselves. Yeah. Like everybody wants an A player. I want A players in my team. Well, then you better have an A plus vision to get A players. They will not work for a B vision. Yeah. Like they, they just won't do it. So if you look at your Amazon business and you've got uh, one widget that you're, uh, that you're not even manufacturing, you didn't design it. You're just buying it from China and selling it. You're going to get C players. Sorry. Yeah. Like you just are. Because no one, no one's excited about that. Literally no one gets excited about that because yeah. the only thing you're doing is just making money. You're just being a middleman. Right. And no one's excited about being a middleman. No A player is excited about that. But if somebody who's creating something new, uh, you know, like in the other room next door, you've got a lab, like it's like you are hands on creating your products. People can get excited about that. But then also like, what's the world you're building? Like for me, beard, uh, beard brand, uh, not, not to, you know, pitch or pimp you out yeah, here, yeah. No, but I, like, I take all the pimping. Okay, uh, good, good. Cause I'm going to do it. I, like, I love the content. I love the vision because it's bringing all these men together who like want the camaraderie. So when you buy a beard brand product, you're not just buying something, you know, some goop in a jar to stick on your beard. You're joining a brotherhood, right? 
And so you can sit down and watch the YouTube channel, which I love doing. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but I love watching the YouTube channel, watching the barbers and everybody, you know, just kind of uh, shooting the shit while yeah. they're uh, hanging out. And that's what you're, that's a bigger vision for people, right? It's like, I want to be a part of that yeah. versus, oh, I'm just want to put some, you know, stuff in a jar. Yeah. Yeah. Smell good. Well, where can people follow you, find you, hire you? <laughs> people can find me at timconley.net. I wish I could get the dot com. Can't yeah. get it. I've been trying to get it for years. And they can find me on YouTube if they're, especially if they're in the uh, marketing agency space. I do a lot of work with uh, clients who are in marketing and advertising. And so I have a YouTube channel that's just Tim Conley, T I M C O N L E Y. You can just find me, do that search, and you'll find me. And I'm about to launch a training and coaching business specifically for agencies called agency ops. And so that's at agencyops.com. but there's just a holding page at, at the time of this recording. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then you're on Twitter too, huh? I'm on Twitter, but mostly just to complain about the world. Yeah. On, on yeah. Twitter. Welcome to the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, this has been another e-commerce conversations. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Lots of lessons that I learned in this one. Tim, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Keep on growing. <laughs>